Before continuing, this analysis is broken into two parts due to its original length. This video is the second of the two. We're gathering more and more and more about the character behind Dan Snyder, but we've got a lot to go through. Let's keep watching. Yeah, but we saw these two women who were writers for you sharing one salary. How mm -hmm. does that happen? It's very simple. There's a common practice in television when hiring writers. If you have a spot for a new writer, sometimes you'll go to two writers and say, hey, if you two new writers for your first job are willing to share a salary, you can both have the job. Mm. They have the opportunity to say, yes, that sounds good, or no, no thank you. In this case, it was two women writers. I've done another show where that teaming was done with two male writers and they split a salary. I did another show where it was a male and a female writer and they split a salary. So and these are all first time writers. All first time writers looking for their first gig. Got it. Now I'm going to go ahead and pause here. I did some research trying to find out, is this something that is a common practice? And I was not personally able to track down anything. I had not heard of that being an acceptable thing to take a singular position, split the pay, and then present it to two different people just based off of a lack of work experience. That feels like some mm. workplace misconduct in general. I don't know that that would have worked or flown in any other situation outside of this situation that he's describing here. I can't imagine a world where you would like go to apply at a Walmart, but since you're new and you haven't ever done any cashiering, they're going to hire you at $4.50 an hour because the $9 an hour for the full-time position with experience is for somebody who has experience. So they're going to hire two people to do the same job at $4.00. It doesn't fly in any other professional environment. I was not able to track down any evidence of people going through this. There's plenty of debate about what is acceptable for writers, what goes into the pay, the schedule of writers and scale and everything that goes into that. But I, I was not able to track down a single instance of two people saying that they had reported taking half of one person's wage because they were so new. If you are watching this and you have experience in this, let me know in the comments below, especially if you're familiar on the workings of the set and the writer's rooms and everything like that. Does this happen? Have you experienced this yourself where you took half a person's wage because you were so new at it? It doesn't sound far-fetched, but it doesn't sound like acceptable workplace behavior. So perhaps, perhaps that was a normal thing for him. Uh, and the set of Nickelodeon, which then if that's the case, I have even more problems with Nickelodeon rather than just Dan Schneider. It seems as though perhaps Dan Schneider was a uh, substantial, but just another cog in the machine of Nickelodeon themselves, which no doubt is exclusively centered on making more money as most businesses are. So let me know from your own personal experience in the comments, is that something that happens? The split between writer's wages uh, on a full-blown a uh, professional said with a budget like Nickelodeon. Perhaps, perhaps. I just, outside of small indie films, I don't see that happening. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, let's continue on as Dan Schneider tries to excuse more of this. Got it. Now in the series, they also highlighted two black actors who said that they felt overlooked. Now I want to be clear. I'm never going to speak on anyone else's journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can talk about my experience how my experience was with you, what I saw prior to working with you. But again, I don't want to speak on anyone's journey. I saw you be honored for diversity in your work. Yes. And the reason for that is diversity. I'm going to go ahead and pause here. Yes. Honored for diversity. And he, he goes on to explain here in just a second, which you'll see. He had like a, a small minuscule number of people of color that were involved in the sets and so he was honored for diversity and to me <laughs> to me that strikes as humorously disgusting that maybe one or two people in an entire cast is all that it takes to be honored for diversity that doesn't have anything to do with anything boogie bringing that up is just boogie gassing up dan schneider just because the entirety of the industry is failing in a certain area does not mean that a reward from the failing industry is worth anything. So just because an industry that is renowned for racism is giving a, a producer a, a reward for diversity, 
oh well, the source makes it irrelevant. So that whole call into thing of you were the most diverse, I don't care. Just because you were the most diverse out of not diverse does not make you diverse. It just makes you less not diverse than the next person. Anyway, let's see his response. Diversity has always been very important to me in my shows. If you go back to the very first Nickelodeon show I ever made, that's very evident, as it is in the second one, and then the first movie I ever made for Nickelodeon, which starred Keenan and Kel, and every show I did after that had a lead black actor in it. I'm very proud of that. It's very important to me. And not only am I proud that they were in my shows, I'm exceptionally proud of the achievements they've had beyond my shows and they've gone on to bigger and better things and that gives me a great sense of pride so during this what we're able to see is that he's proud of the fact that he was being diverse which again maybe at the time having a lead person of color was more diverse at the time again not diverse it does not actually address the feeling of these people being overlooked. So Dan Schneider did a good job at pandering and got an award from the non-diverse company about pandering, which goes directly against the people that experienced it. There, ugh, there's, just, there's a lot of problematic stuff in here, so let's just keep watching. Well, something that really kind of bothered me was how they depicted your relationship with the cast. Yeah. Mm. Pausing here. Let's us know a little bit more, again, almost verbatim, of the the mindset and the approach to this interview. Boogie went into this bothered by how they were picking on Dan. So again, it's not said verbatim anywhere that Boogie and Dan are friends, but it is sure enforced and reinforced by both verbal and nonverbal communication throughout the entirety of this interview. Again, revisiting, it gives us the feeling that this is not for the benefit of the people that had to go through terrible things, but just for the benefit of allowing Dan to give excuses, which freedom of speech demands that he has the ability to give those excuses. But this is not the interview that people needed and or wanted. So let's keep watching. It bothered me too. Yeah, just me being there. I knew the dynamic was trust. I understood that in situations where they may have. So it was trust. Now there's some problematic things, but non-verbally speaking from Dan during that, he does a little bit of a lip compression, a mouth shrug in that, which a mouth shrug is akin to a shoulder shrug. It, it lines up with insecurity or insincerity, the I don't know. So that coming in there with the lip compression mm, pushes me to believe that perhaps there was something more that needed to be said or unpacked around that, that even Dan himself was acknowledging non-verbally, but with the little lip compression mouth shrug that was in there and the placating gesture mm, sure we'll go along with that is what we're getting non-verbally from that so mm, questioning even in between that whole interaction there but let's keep watching i've had turmoil whether it be with their families whether it be other castmates they came to you versus how they made you look with that said amanda Bynes was brought up in the series mm -hmm. Pausing here, Amanda Bynes is a huge segment of the docuseries. Again, go watch. But what people have brought up very regularly, and we'll, I, I'll talk a little bit more at here, is that the mindset that was being produced here was that Dan wanted to be on the side of the children and be a confidant of the children. Oftentimes, and, and maybe not oftentimes, repeatedly downplayed the reliability of the children's parents. So as a child wants to leave their parents or is having difficulty with their parents, Dan wants to step in and be that portion of things for them, which could be at first conceived as kind-hearted and supportive. But that's not what Dan's role was supposed to be, especially as a producer of a show, a professional workplace. He, he wasn't supposed to take the place of Guardian ever once. Some kids made the decision to kind of insert him into that, and he wanted that behavior. He wanted to be more accepted as a confidant, oftentimes, than the parents themselves. This became more and more and more clear as the parents various parents would push back against his side of things, he would try to present himself to the kids as more open, more accepting, more kind, more this, more that, more enticing to the children than their own parents who are seeing problematic behavior and calling it out. So this is a little bit of manipulation from Schneider on this point, and it it plays in rather darkly to the rest of his behaviors and how he interacted with the various scenes and production. But 
let's hear how this is addressed. And her emancipation and how you were involved in that. Can you talk to us about it a bit? Sure. Um, Amanda was between the ages of 16 and 17 and she wanted to get emancipated from her parents, mm. which was a fairly common thing with successful young actors, at least at the time. Pausing it there, wanted to get emancipated, and then he does a qualifier to offer a little bit of an excuse or leeway. He plays the numbers game. It's a low level of manipulation being like, oh, but a lot of people did it at the time, so let's not focus too much on the problematic behavior that I'm about to do here. He hasn't offered that qualifier anywhere else until now. It wants to kind of push a little bit of heat off of his own back. Let's watch. At least at the time. Sure. Um, and she wanted that for herself. So she turned to her team, which included her lawyer, her agent, her manager, her publicist, me, because she included me as part of her team, thought of me that way. We supported her. She tried to get emancipated and it ended up not working out. And she didn't. Well, since we're here, let's I'm going to go ahead and pause there. So we're hearing how this gets really messy really fast, not only because of the legalities, again, of all of this dealing with minors, but my feeling towards parents who push their kids into the stardom early, early on like that. Oftentimes the parents themselves are problematic. So I have difficulties with that. There's problematic sides on both sides. I don't necessarily uh, trust in Amanda Bynes' parents and their decision making to allow their kid to go through what their kid went through. I don't necessarily believe or trust in Dan Schneider for what he tried to then take in and do as himself as well. It seems to be all problematic. And again, the the show, the docuseries focuses heavily on Dan Schneider during this and the problems that he presented as a producer. But to me watching it, what I ended up seeing a lot was that Dan Schneider's ability to do X, Y, Z is not because Dan Schneider was something special. It's because Nickelodeon is the problem, which if you watch the docuseries, Nickelodeon refused to respond to any questions on any level about anything outside of a very constructed template copy paste sort of response of we pay attention to all of our problems all equally because of blah, 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 blah. A very corporate, detached, unrealistic, depersonalized version of a response and if nickelodeon had been doing their due diligence if they, as they've said or claimed that they have then the problematic behaviors of dan schneider and his subordinates that he hired which is a whole segment in and of itself that would not have been accepted permitted or allowed on any level mm. there's a lot of issues here let's keep watching for a moment there was also an incident where she had ran away from home, if yes. you would. Um, can you talk to us a little bit, just to clear the air of exactly what happened in that situation? Yes. Uh, one night, it was very late, well after midnight, one or two in the morning, phone rang, I answered, it was Amanda. She was upset, she was in distress, she had had some conflict with her parents, I think her father, and she called me. I was immediately concerned about her safety. I called someone who I knew was fairly nearby. That person was able to go and pick her up. Then I knew she was safe. I felt better. She ended up being taken to the police. Well, regardless of what some people- I'm gonna go ahead and pause here. Fascinating for me. While watching through this, he seems, Schneider seems to have a fairly uh, consistent recollection of the series of events. It doesn't seem as though he's packing the narrative. It doesn't seem as though he's adding any extra details to amplify certain facets or downplay certain areas or anything along those lines. It seems to be fairly factually straightforward. So watching that, that encourages me to believe in his authenticity throughout that. What, what this scenario paints to me is a lot of the grim nature, again, of putting children into roles like these is that they oftentimes will lack supportive community and so perhaps in this situation amanda who did not have anybody else who could relate to her scenario uh was having trouble with her parents and the only person that she could think of to reach out to would be one of her co-workers or her producer who as we already know, has tried very hard to present himself as like a guardian-esque sort of figure towards some of the specific choice few children on the shows. If you do watch this, it's it's difficult to, to go through, especially considering how impossible of positions so many of these kids were put in and what happened to them as they tried to grow through that and become an adult through that. And it... 
it's a mess. And so I feel deeply for the kids, especially like in this specific instance, Amanda, who had to make impossible decisions. And unfortunately, the decisions that were made were not in her best interest. Uh, it, it always seemed to be very fueled by in the monetary best interest, which is unfortunately the MO of many production companies, regardless of brand name. Uh, so it, it it's complicated. It was a lot to watch, watch through. Let's continue watching this though. Regardless of what some people may think, I think it's only positive that you are there for people when they need you. That said, let's talk about some of the pause in here. I think it's only positive. Again, Boogie just showing that he is all for, he's seen more or less as fangirling for Dan Schneider during this point. As we've already covered in this video, there are many other instances that are not positive for an adult to be present as such for a child. It it obviously gets complex for sure, especially in, in allegations that were floating around at the time. But to say that it is only ever positive is a clear admission of bias of Boogie towards Dan Snyder, which throws the validity of this interview into question. So let's keep watching. About some of the things that have just been swirling forever. Okay. You were banned from your set. Never, never, never happened. That is a false rumor. What happened? Add it to the list of false Talk rumors. Talk to me. What happened? They were Never, never, never. So a lot of verbal reiterations of that. A lot of disgust coming into the corner of his nose as well. And this seems to be a fairly genuine emotional response to what's being said here. So with what Dan's saying, I would be... Um, and this is frustrating to say. I would be encouraged to believe what he was saying just from his nonverbal display. Through the synchronization of the emotional display of things, it seems as though it's fairly authentic. Now, I don't no, and I was not able to unearth verbatim whether or not he was fully banned. But what I do find fascinating, say he was not banned. His response to this is more emotionally genuine and synchronized than anywhere else in the interview that I've seen. And it not shockingly is in regards to himself. He has a substantial amount of disgust in regards to people saying that he was banned from his own set. So I'm seeing that creep out there. Let's hear his response. Adult actresses at the time, and they had their own specific reasons for not wanting to do the show anymore. Mm. I'm not judging that. It got tense, and what they don't know, maybe, is I did everything I could to make that show go away. My producer partner at the time, we would call and say, this is a not a good situation. Okay. So I, I decided I'm gonna do what most showrunners do, which is, you're not on the set. There's a direct- During the time that he's saying what, what many people might not have known or what these people might not have known is that me and my showrunner would call in regularly. He has a lot of difficulty holding eye contact during that time, a lot of no, or a lot of looking down. No shakes are in there as well. Fairly macro, so I can't really hold too much to those, but he is looking down during that entire time, which is lightly strained from the areas around. Again, he has looked down, had those prolonged eye blinks throughout the entirety of the interview makes it difficult to be able to rely on. But I am noticing that during that time, he does look down. My question is why? And it does also line up with the, the suspicious nature of that area in general. There's no proof that he had done dot, dot, dot again and again and again. And he's showing that little tiny pop of nonverbal communication. And it doesn't necessarily actually fit with everything else that has been presented, especially since everything that he has touched has been turning to gold. He's the golden child. And even at the time, he was very proud of all of his accomplishments. It doesn't sound like it was something that he would have been like, hey, let's stop this. At this point, he seemed to be pretty money hungry in general so i'm a little suspicious of that but the nonverbal communication for that is not it's not substantial enough for me to be able to say i i fully disagree but it is something for me to make note of regardless going to continue through there's a director there to shoot it i'll go up to the writer's room i'll work on the next script but yeah. because everybody who's so used to me caring about every detail of every show so yeah. much for me not to be on the set yeah, maybe some people thought I got banned. So it was more of an assumption because this guy's usually here and now he's not. I don't know if it was an assumption. I don't know if somebody thought they were making me look bad by saying I got banned uh, from the set. I have no idea. Okay. All I know is I was never banned from the set. Yep. Mm. 
little bit of a spike in his eye blocking and looking down during that time. A little bit suspicious, saying a lot of I don't knows with macro no shakes in there. That would be, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That kind of makes sense synchronized wise, but that, that prolonged eye blinking in there. And then just considering the context of the actual workplace environment itself. It is suspicious, but there's not enough to say. Perhaps he wasn't banned. Perhaps that was never a thing. Nonverbally speaking from this interview, it's it's pretty difficult to say. The darkest part of this series discuss child predators. Now, I want to make sure that we clear a couple of things up. Okay. Brian. Pausing. I want to make sure that we clear a couple of things up. If Boogie goes into this... And the first thing that he tries to do, or one of the first things that he tries to do, is clear things up for Dan. Again, it just lets us know. Interviewer is not there for truth. Interviewer is there for Dan. We'll see. Does Boogie, does he try to clear things up for the benefit of Dan? Let's watch. Brian Peck was not hired by you. No, I did not hire Brian Peck. This was a Tolan Robbins production? Yeah. And when Drake and I So it is. He immediately tries to say, I want to clear things up. Dan, you're off the table. This is a this isn't your problem. For those of you who have not watched the docuseries, Brian Peck was hired and on the team for Dan Schneider and displayed very egregious pedophilic behavior that he himself admitted to and also carried out horrible abuse to one of the cast members which we will likely cover on the channel if you do want to see more of this video series so brian peck is an accused uh self-proclaimed pedophile with pedophilic behaviors in tow it wasn't something conceptual it was very practically so very terrible human that worked on the set with Dan Schneider with all of these kids. Um, let's watch this and talk a little bit. And when Drake and I talked and he told me what had happened, I was more devastated by that than anything that ever happened to me in my career thus far. Mm. And I told him, I'm here for you. What do you need? Which Drake mentioned in the show that we watched last night. And next, I heard that... I'm going to go ahead and pause here. So something that's distinctly different from the times earlier where we heard Schneider maybe try to shift a little bit of the blame or attention from certain aspects of what he was doing that was problematic. At this point, he is actually doing a pretty solid job at holding eye contact with the interviewer, with Boogie at this time. So for me, that holding of eye contact it pushes me towards authenticity considering what we've seen in context from dan the entirety of the rest of the interview now there are a number of false statements that are out there false concepts out there that the holding of the prolonged holding of eye contact or a bunch of looking away or all of these different things centered around the eyes movements can give you a guaranteed like black and white answer oh this is fake this is real it's not that black and white it is definitely areas of gray and that's where the context really does come in and it becomes important to watch more than just like one little clip because yes dealing with just the clean cut breaking of eye contact during a problematic statement can be an indicator of deceit it loses a lot of weight if you haven't considered the rest of what that person does in various other contexts or in the context that we're already speaking so we can't really rely on the fact that he's holding eye contact as a genuine indicator of authenticity in and of itself but considering everywhere else that he said, it does push a little bit more towards authenticity. Which again, Drake, the person who was severely abused as a minor, he himself also more or less said what Schneider said here. So there's also contextual synchronization between the two. Now, whether or not that's because Schneider watched the interview and was like, I'll just tailor my statement to what was said about me. That's, that can't be said from this interview here. But I'm pushed towards a little bit of authenticity. The fact that Drake also said something extremely similar pushes me towards authenticity. Mm. The series really does paint it quite clearly how problematic not just Dan Schneider is, but the entirety of the entertainment industry, especially when it comes to sex and children. Really problematic stuff. So let's keep watching. He went to court 
when this guy was being tried, Peck. And when Drake walked in, he saw 50 people sitting on the side of the courtroom supporting Peck. A lot of them... Mm. Drake doesn't mention the number. He just says the, the one side is full. So the fact that Dan Schneider knows the number, that's fascinating to me. Perhaps it was like part of footage not aired in the docuseries that it was covered the exact number. But Drake doesn't mention that. For Dan to mention that there were exactly 50 people, and then he's about to go on and say that 41 of these people wrote uh, character letters for this, this person. Those numbers and having them directly on hand like that honestly actually feels more suspicious towards me. Why would Dan have those numbers if it weren't for his own benefit? Because obviously they didn't serve Drake. The The story itself held just as much weight without the exact numbers. So why does Dan Schneider have that? It's just a question, but not really implicative enough to do anything with. But let's keep watching this. A lot of them pretty famous. Of course, Drake was devastated that that happened. And, and even more disappointing 41 of those people wrote letters for Peck, character letters, praising him for who he was and asking for leniency. And they knew that he was guilty. They knew he had confessed to some degree. Mm -hmm. And they still did this. It's just, that's baffling that adults would do that. Yeah. Mm, so now, now this is fascinating. What Dan's done during this time is he's the producer uh, of this show that Brian Peck also works for. So he does have a fair amount of control. What he then does here is he shifts the attention of blame from himself and his own problematic situation in this to the people that also behaved very problematically in support of this pedophilic person. Now, it has come out that when they were asked to write these character letters that they had known everything so they would have never done that and again it kind of feels like perhaps 41 people are covering their own butt i'm sure that perhaps some of them didn't know at all but on other levels it feels like some people are like oh i had no clue at all and uh, oopsie poopsie i would have never written that so that's problematic but what i find fascinating is that dan is being like you know what instead of people being mad at me for my problematic behavior look Look anywhere else. Just look at anyone else that also had problematic behavior and pay attention to them instead. And I can't believe that they did something so bad. Am I right? You know, like, look over there instead. And so when we're hearing that verbal pattern come out from Dan, it comes across as a little bit weaselly, a little bit manipulative, because it is manipulative on some level. Whether or not he's intending it to be consciously, that is exactly what that sort of verbal ploy is intended for. So let's keep watching. Yeah. And I don't know if people know this, but Drake's mom, a lovely woman who I stay in contact with this day, she came to me at the time and she said, Dan, I'm not good with words like you are. And would you help me with my speech for the judge? And I said, of course. And I did. And he ended up going to prison and serving his time. And yeah, that was probably the darkest part of my career. Okay. People have issues with this, this little pop of emotion here and centered around the process of writing this thing for Drake Bell's uh, mother and this sudden outflow of negative emotion is exclusively shown here. Obviously, we've seen the majority of the rest of the interview and nowhere else discussing nothing else does he show any form of emotion. And then in this part, he shows a very short, brief splash of emotion that then uh, disappears almost as quickly as it shows up. Now, but what I do find fascinating is that, mm, yes, the emotion has a fairly quick onset. The, the profile of it is a little bit faster than what I would normally expect in this sort of situation. It doesn't look like he's really muscling down any form of emotion before coming to this one. So it's not like he's like trying to keep a straight face and then bursting into tears. That's different. And you can usually see a person trying to keep a straight face just before bursting into tears. That's not what he's doing here. It seems as though it just shows up here. And then it disappears 
very quickly. But what I the, that that alone, just the 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 profiles of it alone, the the longevity, the profiles, that feels suspicious to me. But what makes it complex for me is that you can very clearly see that during this time, his eyes are welling up with tears. Now, perhaps he knows how to do that through acting routines. Maybe he's picked up on something in that way. Maybe he knows how to cry at the drop of a hat. Or this is affecting him on some level emotionally and it's displaying here which then i have to ask why is it only displaying here and how come it's not showing up showing up anywhere else not counting any of the in-between spaces or anything like that that was edited out of the interview because you know this was heavily edited if that's if, if this is genuine here what about all of the rest of it where he wasn't showing emotion and what if that part was genuine why is this now showing emotion and its effect therein it's just complex. I cannot say for certain why this little blip of emotion seems to well up in here. It seems suspicious in its timing, just the longevity, and like I said, the profiles and longevity of it. It seems authentic through some of the more difficult to control physiological responses, not the least of which was the, the tearing up. But it does feel extremely suspicious and i do believe that many people are worried that it is a manipulation point by dan schneider trying to humanize himself a little bit more and there i mean there's that possibility but again i still keep getting hung up on the physiological less easily controlled factors that he displays here as well so a little hard to say there let's keep watching there's only a few minutes left to this video and here's the kicker that i really don't get after he got out of prison and was, to my knowledge, a registered sex offender, he was hired on a Disney Channel show. I, I, don't, I don't understand that. Um, I never, yeah, you know, I don't understand. Yeah. Okay, so we're hearing Schneider try to appeal to some of the people that are having issues. He's saying like, oh, I mean, I just don't even understand how a registered sex offender could be allowed onto a child's show again. Yes, everybody is very on board with that statement. So that lets everybody have a little bit of rapport with Dan Schneider. And that does feel a little bit manipulative to me considering the context of what dan schneider is being accused of not the least of which is this problematic behavior towards minors he is not a registered sex offender nobody has come forward with any crimes that he has done towards children it's just been residual problematic behavior or problematic behavior in general not towards a specific person so we're seeing him now try to, again, divert attention from himself over to Peck, which, again, Peck is his own nightmare in and of himself. But we're not here for Peck. We're here for Dan and the fact that he's trying to shift attention off of himself to anyone else is a little suspicious. So we're seeing that. We agree that it's not, it's not okay that Peck is allowed to work in any industry, including children, on any level. But that's not why we're here. That's not the point of this this interview. So stop trying to divert attention. Let's keep watching. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing it, man. Are you okay? You want to take a minute? No, I'm all right. Let's, let's keep going. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I think we really unpacked some important things. We set the record straight on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Before I let you get out of here, I appreciate the vulnerability that you use in knowing that there's definitely things that you would have and should have done differently. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that we haven't discussed? Anything that if you could go back and navigate the journey differently, what would that look like? Um, yeah, there's definitely things that I would do differently. Um, one that I think would be really, really important is when you're hiring young actors, minors, to work in television, I would suggest that we have a licensed therapist there to oversee that process for the specific reason of making sure that those kids really wanted to do this job, that yeah. they really wanted to be on television. Yeah. Maybe they should even be informed about what that means. What's it gonna mean if you're famous? What's that gonna mean on social media? What's it gonna mean within your family? Right. Let them find out. And then that way, if a kid doesn't wanna be on a TV show, they can opt out. 
Yeah. That, that psychologist, that therapist could come to us and say, this kid is, is, doesn't want to do it, or their parents aren't, aren't uh, understanding of what's going to come. And then we could avoid the mistake of ever putting a kid in a TV show that didn't want to be there. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you caught that. His solution is not to fix the problematic behavior. That's not his solution. He's not denying that there's problematic behavior. What he's saying is that he wants to have somebody explain to children more clearly that there will be problematic behavior. That's his solution. We want somebody there to be like, no, you really need to know this is going to be hellish for you. This is going to be extremely inappropriate. There will be bad things for you. I uh, just wanted to, to let you know that before you get in into this. So what he's saying is that he's wanting to shift the responsibility of the adults on production over to the children who are asking for it. That's disgusting. That's horrible. Well, yeah, we want to allow kids to really say, no, I don't want to be a part of the nightmare that I might create. Like, whoa. That's not a solution. That's, that's, that's a manipulation. A hundred percent. And that's extremely irresponsible to try to shift the blame from an adult over to a child, especially an adult in a supervisory boss-like role to a child. That's just, that's not it, fam. I don't care how, how qualified or how wonderful or supportive that psychologist is. The children are not the issue. The children's understanding is not the issue. It's a child. The issue is how the adults are responding and behaving in regards to the children. Now, this issue is far more complex and it's far more pervasive. In my opinion, that is a terrible solution. I think it's a good idea. I think it's a great idea. Kids and families should be far more informed. But that's not the solution. The solution is to change the industry, which is going to take a lot. That's going to take years. That's going to take decades. That's going to take generations of people changing before the industry changes. It might not change. It's extremely difficult to change industries or circles of power from within those circles of power without there being a very substantial mover and shaker involved. And when money comes into play, it's really hard to find somebody who will move and shake enough to change. His first solution here, awful. Instead of us behaving better, let's just let the kids know more so that we're gonna behave terribly. What? All right, let's hear more. Um, and additionally, the main thing that I would change is how I treat people. And, and additionally, Pause. The main thing that I would change? If it was the main thing, Schneider, you would have said that first. What do you suggest? I will change me. I will stop XYZ. I will do XYZ. These are the things that I can and will do to show the betterment and growth of myself. That is the main thing mentioned first. Additionally, here's this idea. That's not what he said. His primary thing was... Let's shift the blame over to the kids. Oh, additionally, I mean the main thing, I should also do better. Ooh, good. Yes, Dan, you should do better. You shouldn't have, in your adult brain, ever have done poorly to kids. That, that, that's telling in and of itself. Let's watch. Everyone. I, I definitely at times didn't give people the best of me. I, I didn't show enough patience. I could be cocky and definitely over ambitious and sometimes just straight up rude and obnoxious. And I am so sorry that I ever was. And um, all right. when I watched the show, I could see the hurt in some people's eyes and it made me feel awful and regretful and sorry. Um, I wish I could go back, you know, especially to those earlier years of my career and all the things that he's admitting that he was are, yes, difficult behaviors, perhaps on some level problematic behaviors, but they're not the issues that really were being uh, discussed or had controversy around in the docuseries. Nobody was like, oh, he was just he was a little he was a little rude. And that was that was my big thing is that he was just a little rude. 
And yes, he was rude, but that's not why they spoke up. It wasn't because he was overambitious that they spoke up. It wasn't for any of these things. It's because of the very extremely borderline illegal behavior that he would partake in that many people, many witnesses would be able to attest to. So he's trying to admit to certain things that aren't really problematic. And this is a manipulation point of admitting to partial guilt of certain things to placate an angry audience. So we're seeing that come out here. Doesn't work. Let's finish this up. Career and bring the growth and the experience that I have now and just do a better job and never ever feel like it was okay to be an asshole to anyone ever. Um, look, I wanted to make funny TV shows for kids, and we definitely did that. But if I could go back, I would get it done in different ways. I, I'd just be nicer as often as possible and listen more to the people on my team. And um, I would do everything that I could to make sure that everyone had a good experience. Uh, that's what I'd do differently. Dan, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you. Thanks for stopping by, man. Thank you. Okay. So at the end, again, all of the things that he said he would do are good things. Yes, do those things. That's for sure. Again, kind of just weaseled around the actual main difficulty that were people have, that people were having in regards to his problematic behavior towards children. But being kinder of a boss absolutely being more understanding of the people under you absolutely all very positive good things to do nobody's arguing that nobody had any questions about that so the fact that he's saying it is on some level a little bit of a manipulator then at the end here we're hearing some thanks and some gratitude there's a handshake uh Boogie says, thanks for coming in and Dan says thank you for like just you thank you for being here, being you, letting us know a little bit more of the rapport between the two of them. Uh, thanks for stopping by. It feels very scripted, feels very forced and calculated, which again, many people were feeling that from the very get-go and verbally speaking was pretty calculated. However, even, even with that calculated nature to this interview we saw so many various red flags of manipulation, uh, responsibility diversion, uh, outright twisting of facts from what was said before all of these different red flags that piled up here that it, it to me it seems as though this interview was not an indicator of a new dan schneider it was an indicator of a caught out dan schneider and one who's trying to save face uh, now in the future the, that's where it really that's where the the rubber hits the the road so to speak and it becomes real messy because for me personally, if I were a parent, I would never, ever, ever, so many evers, trust my child to be in the presence of and under the supervision of Dan Schneider. Not mentioned in this interview, but mentioned in the docuseries, there was another person on his crew that was pedophilic in behavior evidentially so it was not something that was just like oh tossed around in his head there were actual uh, files and evidence towards his pedophilia and to have that be a thing a theme for the people under dan schneider i'm not sure that it was necessarily dan schneider's fault i'm not trying to play a devil's advocate with dan schneider i don't like him but I also equally really don't like the idea of television series centered around children with the same mindset as the adults. I mean, Hollywood in general is problematic. There's a lot of a lot of difficulty that goes into that. A lot of issues are in, in Hollywood in general. And the fact that much of that same atmosphere and environment is just shifted over to children's TV as well is is even more problematic. It's unacceptable in my opinion. And the way that Dan uh, addressed this and then tried to patch this did not feel like it held the weight that the accusations themselves 
uh, demanded and the evidence of those accusations uh, as supported by multiple eyewitnesses, as supported by various paper trails, as supported by various levels of evidence outside of just these people saying something, Dan's response seemed inadequate. The interview seemed calculated. Boogie seemed to fangirl over Dan Schneider throughout the entirety of it. This is not the response that people were wanting in regards to the docuseries. So let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments of this video, especially if you have done digging into this case more so than what I've been able to do so far. I have released a web page that covers my certifications and resources if you are interested in those sorts of things, if you're more interested in the direct applicability of the field that I'm in and how to get into it yourself and the various careers that exist in that. There is a bunch of information in that link in the description if you are interested. Um, but, but without further ado, that's all that I've got for the day. My name is Logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.